Open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 6. We're going to be in verses 16 through 29 today, continuing in our series in John. And this, uh, you could say, a mini-series through John chapter 6. It's going to take us six sermons to get through John chapter 6. And this is number two for us here this morning. And so we're moving through this chapter at not a slow pace, uh, but a, a good pace to get each of these sections of Scripture well in our mind Many of you probably know who the actor is named Johnny Depp. Raise your hand. That's a familiar name to you. Uh, most, of, most of you probably know who Johnny Depp is. If you don't, that's fine. It's not going to really impact uh, the, the sermon for you here this morning. But Johnny Depp is an actor, a very successful actor. In fact, Johnny Depp has had some of the highest grossing movies in Hollywood history. He's also had some of the greatest disappointing uh, movies as well. His movies are either really, really good or really bad, do really well or do really poorly. But because of his success, over 13 years of doing well in these hit movies, Johnny Depp was able to accumulate over $650 million of income in 13 years. Would anybody sign up for Johnny Depp's job? Anybody want that? $650 million in 13 years. Recently, however, Johnny Depp has run into some financial trouble. How does a guy who made $650 million over the course of 13 years run into financial difficulty? Well, I read an article that talked about some of his financial troubles says that Johnny Depp spent $3 million to blast Hunter Thompson's ashes out of a cannon. I don't even understand what I just read, <laughs> except that he spent $3 million to do something that sounds very silly to me. He spent $18 million on a 150-foot yacht. He spent $4 million on a failed record label. He spent $30,000 a month on wine. And I thought my coffee addiction was excessive. <laughs> I'm only at about 20000 a month for coffee. I'm nowhere even in the ballpark of the 30000 for wine. He bought a private island for $5 million. He spent $150,000 a month on round-the-clock security and $300,000 a month to maintain a staff of 40 people at his home. He was running into financial trouble. He didn't have enough liquid assets to pay his monthly bills, which were coming up to $2 million per month just to pay his bills. You know, Johnny Depp is not alone. There are many famous people, rich people, stars, who ended up like that, and it in a sense, we sit here and we listen, and it boosts our sense of self-righteousness to shake our heads in disgust, doesn't it? As we sit and think, that's ridiculous. But what Johnny Depp does on a large scale, I think many of us really do on a smaller scale. You see, Johnny Depp is not different than any other human. He's a man who's in search of a Messiah, He's a man who's in search of something that will bring ultimate joy to his heart, and he's desperately trying to find what that is, and he's spending all of his money to try to fill that thing in his heart, that feeling that something's not quite right. He is in need of a Messiah, and we are all searching for a Messiah. Every human being who's ever walked this planet is searching for a Messiah, what is a Messiah? It is someone or something to salve the soreness of our souls or to satisfy the vacuous hole in our hearts, to bring us ultimate joy and satisfaction, to forgive our sins and to give us eternal life. Everybody's looking for a Messiah. And what or who is your Messiah? Let me give you a little test this morning. I'm going to put a sentence up on the screen, and I want you to fill in the blank. In fact, I don't just want you to do this in your mind. If you're taking notes this morning, take out your paper. I want you to write this sentence down, and I want you to physically fill in the blank of this sentence and try to be as honest and soul-searching as you can with this statement. How would you complete this statement? Things would be so much better if... How would you fill in that sentence? 
Go ahead and do it. If you have notes here, a piece of paper this morning, just write that in. Things would be so much better if, or I would have more joy if, or maybe you would say instead of if, when, because you're anticipating that something's going to happen, things would be so much better when, what? How do you fill in that blank? What do you put in the end of that sentence? We need to be careful because whatever it is that you put in that blank, however it is that you complete that sentence, that completion of that sentence, that object in that sentence, that person in that sentence, that whatever it is you put into that sentence stands to potentially be what you are trusting in as your Messiah. Because that item that you put into that sentence potentially is the thing that you're counting on to bring you joy, satisfaction, and fulfillment in your life. Now all of us have something we could put into that sentence, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we're trusting it as our functional Messiah, but all of us to some degree are not trusting Jesus as much as we should, and all of us to some degree are trusting in something else in our lives to bring us ultimate joy and satisfaction, and the question is, what is it for you? You see, it was clear for the Jewish people the Jewish people in Jesus' day, their tastes were simpler than $30,000 a month on wine in a $5 million private island. The Jewish people in Jesus' day, for them, what they thought would bring them joy, what they thought would complete their life, or life would be so much better if, it's quite simple for the Jewish people in Jesus' day, it was just this, if we had enough to eat and if we could be freed from Roman occupation in our land. Those were really the two big things for the Jewish people. If we could have enough to eat because poverty was widespread in that day and there wasn't enough to eat for many people and so they wanted food and they wanted freedom. And so Jesus comes and he can provide food. And last week we looked at the feeding of the 5,000 and what Jesus was doing in the feeding of the 5,000 was trying to move the people from lesser to greater. He was trying to show them, if I can satisfy you in this way, just think how much more I could satisfy you in a greater way. If I can fill your belly, just think how much I could fill your soul. But they missed the point. They took the food and they ran with it. And they enjoyed the food and they wanted more food and all they could think of was the physical and they missed the lesser to greater. And you see, for them, having food and having their freedom was their Messiah. It was their satisfaction. It was the answer to that sentence for them. And so they wanted to make Jesus king, not because they wanted him to be their Messiah, but because he could bring them the things that they thought would satisfy them. He would bring them their Messiah. For them, their functional Messiah was food and freedom, and Jesus was able to bring those things. They didn't want him. They wanted what he could give them instead. And the feeding of the 5,000 ends with verse 15, and it says this, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, Jesus fled the scene. He got out of there. He wasn't about to be made king. He wasn't about to be used by the people to fulfill what they wanted. They had missed the point of his opening illustration. And so now we pick up that illustration in these verses. Today, Jesus now continues to teach in the aftermath of the misplaced Messiah mishap that took place with the feeding of the 5,000. They missed the point of the bread, and now he starts to show them what it actually means to be fed by him, that he is not there to give them bread, but instead he is there to be be their bread. And that is the overall theme of chapter 6. Jesus is saying, I did not come to feed you bread. I came to be your bread. I satisfy not the things that I give you, but I satisfy. And friends, how easily we conflate those two things. How easily we seek Jesus because of what he can give us and not because of who he is. 
And so this morning in this text, we're going to see two distinct stories. The first story is Jesus walking on water, and the next story is Jesus starting this conversation with some of the crowd that was left over. In both of these stories, we're going to see how Jesus is being misused. We're going to look at the misuses of Jesus as Jesus keeps talking to them about what does it mean to be fed by him. And then it's going to complete in verses 28 and 29 where the main thrust is really given and Jesus shows us what it really looks like to be fed and satisfied by him. And so let's look today and what it says first and I'm going to look at this story of Jesus walking on the water and I would say the heading of this section is this some people want a peace providing Messiah this is one way that Jesus is misused this is one way that we seek Jesus not for who he is but what he can give us and we know that he has the power to bring peace to our lives but that's not ultimately why he came for us so let's look together at the text of Scripture. Verse 15, Jesus had gotten away. He had gone to a mountain, but we learn from Mark that he actually had shooed his disciples away. When he saw that the people were going to come and make him king, he told his disciples, get on a boat and get out of here. He wanted to get them away from the scene because he knew that they would most likely jump on top of this idea of making Jesus king. There was nothing they wanted more than to see Jesus be king. And so he says, get on a boat, get out of here. This is not good for you to be here, and I'll catch up with you later. And maybe the intent was for them to go along the shoreline, and he would maybe catch up with them later. We don't know exactly. There's some complications and logistical challenges here in the text to know exactly how this fits together. But verse 16 says, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into the boat. Jesus told them to, go, get out of here. You shouldn't be here for this. I want you to get in this boat. They started to sail. They were going to catch up with Jesus later. Verse 17, they got into a boat, started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. They were expecting Jesus to come to them. In verse 18, then the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And so we see the storm now in the scene. Storms like this were common on the Sea of Galilee. You see, the Sea of Galilee set about 700 feet below sea level, and there are mountains surrounding the Sea of Galilee, and so the combination of warm air and cold air and winds sweeping down from the mountains often caused quick storms to arise and large waves and white caps on this quote-unquote sea. Now, if you've ever been to the Sea of Galilee, you know that it's actually not a sea. It's really just kind of a giant Minnesota lake, if you've ever seen it. It's a large lake but it can get fairly tumultuous. And the disciples find themselves in the middle of a storm. What's interesting about John's story of the Jesus walking on water is it's highly compressed. And you know this story. You've heard this story before. Look with me at the text of Scripture. It says, verse 19, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. They were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Now, you know this story, don't you? Maybe you've heard this story growing up in church or Sunday school. John has cut out a lot of details in fact, there are actually four miracles in this story, and as we piece it together from some of the other Gospels, we have the first miracle, Jesus walks on the water. The second miracle we learned from one of the other Gospels is Jesus calms the storm. The third miracle that we learned from one of the other Gospels is that Peter decides to want to walk on the water. Do you remember that? And now John shows us the fourth miracle. It says Jesus got on the boat, and immediately the boat was just where they were going, just whoosh, just traveled through time and space somehow and landed on the shore where they were headed to their final destination. But John's account of the story cuts out a lot of those details. John's account of the story has them getting to the boat, has the storm coming up, has them seeing Jesus, has them bringing Jesus onto the boat, and then immediately they're at the shore and there's no other details given. He compresses it for a specific reason, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. But let's camp on the storm for a moment before we get there. A storm comes up. And they had traveled three to four miles, but we know from the other Gospels that they had been rowing for about six to seven 
hours. Now think about that, six to seven hours to go about three miles. That's an equivalent of what it's like to live in Los Angeles during rush hour, right? Heavy traffic, but in this case it wasn't traffic, it was a storm. And they were toiling against the storm. And they were pushing against the storm six to seven hours to go three to four miles. I can only imagine at that moment, Peter was probably at the helm. Peter took charge. Come on, guys, get the road. He's like, get the, uh, trying to get everything working together and moving towards the shore. And it was futile. The storm was so strong. Suddenly, they look across the water and they see somebody walking on the water. It's not enough that they were scared lifeless because of the storm. Now they see what they thought was a ghost, we learned from one of the other Gospels. But it wasn't a ghost, and soon they see it's Jesus, and it says here that they were frightened. And Jesus says to them, it is I, do not be afraid. And what Jesus says to them is, it is, I am. Jesus uses the title for God here to his disciples. Note with me, however, that Jesus is the one that thrust them into the storm to begin with. Why did Jesus push them into the storm? I think Jesus pushed them in the storm because they did not quite get the point of the loaves. Mark actually tells us that their hearts were hard and they did not comprehend what Jesus was doing by feeding the 5,000. And so Jesus says, all right, boys, let's go for round two. Get in that boat and I'm gonna thrust you into a storm. He didn't tell them that. He knew what he was doing. Jesus put them out in that storm intentionally so that Jesus could come to them in the storm so that Jesus could show himself to be the God of the storm and get onto their boat. And they welcome him into the boat. And he says, he says to them, it is I, do not be afraid. And they were glad to take him into the boat and immediately, whoop, boats at the shore. That's it's kind of a strange part of the story. I, to be honest with you, until I studied this this week, I think I'd forgotten about that little piece of the story, that, that miracle that took place, that suddenly they were in the middle of the lake and now they're on shore and nobody knows exactly how it happened. Did, did I get put out for a second? I woke up? Or how did we get here at the shore? They just were there at the shore. Why did John include that piece of the story? Well, we'll see this here in just a moment. Jesus comes and he gets on the boat. They invite Jesus into their boat. You could say that they trusted in Jesus. They believed in Jesus that Jesus revealed himself to be God. It is I am. I am here, God, the God of the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus was showing himself to be the God of the Old Testament. One of the Psalms, Psalm 77, talks about the parting of the Red Sea, and it says in that Psalm that it was God himself that led them through the sea, and now Jesus shows up in the middle of the water as if to say, I am the God of the Old Testament. I am the one with power over the waters like you experience in the Old Testament with the party of the Red Sea. It's me. I'm the one. And they welcome him. They invite him into the boat. They believe in him and they trust in him and immediately they've made it to the other side of the shore. Now, think through the details that John included here. What is the huge detail that he left out? What's one massive detail that he left out of his story. Notice as you read this, they're in the middle of the storm. They see Jesus out in the middle of the water. They see him coming towards the boat. They're scared. They bring him into the boat, and immediately they're in the shore. What part did he leave out? You notice that he left out the calming of the storm. It never tells us that Jesus calmed the storm. And I think John left that out on purpose. Why would John leave that out on purpose? purpose. I think the reason why John left that out is because the point he's trying to make is that we don't accept Jesus for what he can do for us. We accept Jesus because of who he is. And he didn't talk about the calming of the storm. That's obviously what the disciples wanted. John didn't even mention it in this version of the story. They accept him in the boat and they're immediately they're on the shore. If we didn't have the other Gospels, we wouldn't even know that the storm was calmed. We do know the storm is calmed because of the other Gospels. But if we were just reading John, we wouldn't even know that piece of the story. So what can we learn from this at this point, at the end of this particular story? Number one is this. Having the miracle worker in your boat is more important than having a miracle worked in the middle of your storm. Having the miracle worker in your boat is more important than having a miracle worked 
in the middle of your storm. You see, all of us want peace, don't we? All of us have experienced some storm in life. All of us have experienced a tumultuous circumstance in our lives, and we all want that circumstance to be calmed. We would all love it if Jesus would be able to say, peace, be still, in your storm. Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like that if God just calmed every storm in your life? You see, sometimes we want to use Jesus for that reason. Sometimes we don't necessarily want Jesus, but we want what Jesus can give us. Let's just think for a moment, if Jesus hadn't have calmed the storm, would they still have experienced peace? And I think they would have, because they invited him in the boat, they were glad to see him. You see, the peace came not because he calmed the storm, the peace came because he was in the boat with them. They were with the one who makes peace. And whether he made peace or not for them, it brought peace to them to have him in the boat with him because he is the master and the God of peace, even if he doesn't bring that peace to your life exactly when you want him to bring that peace to your life. And this is a common use people have for a Messiah. They want a Messiah who's going to supply and provide peace in their lives, and maybe for you in your life, it's that, Jesus, Lord, please, Jesus, reconcile the relational issues in my marriage. Maybe that's your prayer today. Jesus, please regulate the pain in my body. Jesus, please rein in the rebellion of my teenagers. I'm sure that prayer has been prayed thousands of times from some of you here this morning. Jesus, please restore the health of my loved one. And we inquire to our Messiah to calm the storm in our lives. Jesus, we know you can do it. Now please be my Messiah. You see, when we do it like that, sometimes I think the Messiah is the peace. What we really want is the peace, but do we really want Jesus? What if Jesus didn't calm the storm? What if Jesus chooses not to calm your storm? Do you still have peace with him in your boat? Instead, what we ought to say is, Jesus, please be my peace in this storm. Maybe you're not gonna take the storm away. Maybe you're not going to relieve the relational tension in my marriage. Maybe you're not going to remove the pain in my body, but Lord, in the storm, be my peace, even if you don't give me that peace. Be my peace. Assure me with your presence. Assure me with your provision. Assure me that I know that someday I will have eternal life. You see, it's more important that we have the miracle worker in our boat than it is having the miracle worked in our storm. Secondly, I want you to see this. When he's on our boat, we can cease from our toil. And this is a really neat thing in this text. It says they were toiling, they were working, they were pushing against the storm. And when Jesus entered the boat, suddenly, boom, it's gone. No more toiling. They're done. They're done toiling. And they're at the shore. Their work is over. The maker of peace, the giver of life, the one who provides eternal life is in the boat with them, and their toiling ceases. Immediately they are at their destination. And it's as if it's, he's saying to us, when you take me onto your boat and you believe we will get to our destination, it may be tumultuous, it may be through a storm, but when I am on your boat with you, we will arrive and we can stop rowing, we can stop toiling. It doesn't mean that that storm will go away. It doesn't mean that the tumult that we're experiencing will somehow just subside. But you see, having the storm calm down does not have to be the ultimate thing in our hearts anymore. And sometimes I think that's what happens to us when we're in the middle of a storm or in the middle of a circumstance that's difficult. What becomes ultimate in, in, in our heart is, God, please take this away. And that's the ultimate thing in our hearts. And friends, that's not the way God wants us to operate. What he wants to be ultimate in our heart is him. Not him taking away the circumstance and the storm. He wants to be ultimate. And I think this is the reason John composed it this way. As soon as Jesus is on the boat, their toiling stops. 
And friends, for us, we toil and we labor and we desire so badly for those things to go away, but we need to find peace in the midst of the storm because we have the master of peace with us on our boat. That's the point. Not to misuse Jesus, but to love Jesus and accept Him for who He is and what He provides. Secondly, some people want a provision-supplying Messiah. Some people want a peace-providing Messiah. Some people want a provision-supplying Messiah. And that's where we come to the next section of the text here. Look at, at verse 22 with me. It says, On the next day the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there, and Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. This is a real confusing uh, part of the text here to know exactly what was happening. But in short, this is what's happening. Jesus sends his disciples away. Jesus doesn't get into a boat. The crowd sees that the disciples' boat has made it to the other side. They knew that Jesus wasn't in that boat, and so they don't know where Jesus is, and they're looking for him. Verse 23, other boats from Tiberias came near the place where he had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So this means that other people are coming to the scene. Other people have heard about Jesus' reputation, and they're coming to see him. They're coming to be fed by him. A crowd is gathering once again. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, and so we have these people seeking and searching to find Jesus, but not finding Jesus. And John actually devotes quite a bit of time to talk about the people seeking and trying to find Jesus, futilely seeking him out. And Jesus had actually miraculously gotten into the boat, as we know, by walking in the water. The crowd didn't know that, and they landed at Capernaum. And now the rest of this story takes place in the synagogue at Capernaum. This is a different scene. He's teaching now in a synagogue. And the people were searching to find Jesus. Why were they searching to find Jesus? They were not searching to find Jesus because they wanted Jesus. They were searching to find Jesus because they wanted what Jesus could give them. And that was free bread. The Romans had a little adage, we keep the people happy with bread and circuses. And that's exactly what the Romans did. They would provide free bread for their people. They would provide entertainment. The Romans had set aside 93 days per year for public games at the government's expense. How would you like to live in the Roman Empire and have 93 holidays for sporting events and holidays? Anybody would enjoy 93 days off? That's, that's just excessive. But that's what the Romans' philosophy was of keeping the people happy. And this was the people's Messiah, and Jesus could provide this, and they wanted the bread that he could give. And as I read these verses, I'm struck with people and people's seeking of something. And friends, it grieves my heart to watch people seek and you are around people, and maybe you've noticed as you've been around people that everybody's looking for something. I brought up the illustration of Johnny Depp, and when I read an article like that, my heart aches for a person like that who's so desperate to find something, but obviously is not able to find it. But it's not just with people like that. People are searching. People are seeking. People are looking for something. They're not necessarily seeking God. They're seeking something that will satisfy and ultimately bring that satisfaction to their soul. I see people with their obsessions and their excesses. I watch people float from religion to religion and philosophy to philosophy and church to church and search for something, and they go through alcohol and drugs and substances and love and everything else to try to find something that's gonna satisfy. And I think verses 22 through 24 is a picture of that, the seeking, the endless seeking of people. And friends, that bothers me, to watch people seeking. It not only bothers me, but it inspires me, challenges me, motivates me to be there to tell people, to be faithful to tell people. You just saw a testimony in a baptism this morning of somebody seeking, and he happens to find somebody from our church. And praise God that Chris Reuter didn't just uh, do the transaction at come and go and say, all right, well, have a good day, be well, enjoy your gas, enjoy your pop, whatever it was. Praise God that Chris Reuter took a time to notice that this was a young man who was seeking and who needed Christ. And there are a lot of people seeking, friends. And maybe today you're sitting here and you're seeking and you're not finding. Maybe today you're sitting here this morning thinking you're seeking Jesus, 
but really you're not seeking Jesus. Maybe you're seeking what Jesus gives you instead of seeking Jesus himself. Maybe you're in church in hopes that it'll give you a better life or help you in a crisis in your life or just a general blessing. If that's the case, you've missed the point. You should be here to seek Jesus for Jesus' sake, not for what he gives you. And so the people are searching but not finding. Then they find, but they don't actually find. And I like this part of the text. Verse 25, it says, when they found him, ah, we found him on the other side of the sea. They ask him, Rabbi, where have you been hiding from us? Can't you just kind of see how this conversation is going to go? We've been looking all over for you. We are really glad to see you, Jesus. I am so, uh, we just really want to sit and listen to you preach some more. We just love your teaching so much. And they just kind of give all these compliments to him, and Jesus just cuts right through it. And I love what Jesus says in verse 26. He answered them, truly, truly, or indisputably, I say this to you, you are not actually seeking me because you saw the signs, but instead because you got a free lunch yesterday, and you're hoping that I'm going to open up the Grand Country Buffet again today. That's what he tells them. Those are pretty harsh words, aren't they? Can you imagine his disciples at this point? I mean, they got to be excited. They see these crowds coming to follow Jesus. They're thinking, this is the moment. This is it. We're going to make Jesus Messiah. We're going to conquer Rome. Look at all these people. What can we do with a crowd like this? How's Rome ever going to compete with these types of crowds? This is it. This is our moment. And Jesus, what does he do? He insults the crowd. <laughs> Jesus, we love you. We want to follow you. Eh, Whatever. You're not here because you like me. You just want more free food. Isn't that right? His disciples have to be standing there going, oh, come on, don't say this stuff. You're never going to hold your crowd doing this. That's not very seeker sensitive. And one thing I like about Jesus is Jesus is very much not seeker sensitive at all, especially in John chapter 6. He starts with a crowd of possibly 20,000 people, and by the end of John chapter 6, he's got 12 left. He literally offended his crowd instead of trying to engage them by saying things like this. You don't really want me. You just want a free lunch. You see, they found Jesus, but they didn't actually find Jesus. Now, just think of the context for a minute with me. This was the time of the Passover, and in the synagogue, they'd been reading the scriptures about the Passover and the man in the wilderness and all of these issues and Jesus had just fed the people with all this bread and in Judaism they understood that there was a storehouse they thought of it like there's a storehouse in heaven of manna and Moses was unable to unlock the storehouse and release the manna and they believed that when the Messiah came he would unlock the storehouse and the manna would fall from heaven once again so there they are coming to Jesus hey Jesus you got the keys can you unlock that storehouse? You did it yesterday. Let's do it again. You see, they were quick to accept Jesus the way that they accepted Moses, the one who could free them and the one who could feed them. Someone said it like this. They came because their hunger had been satisfied. They were moved not by their full hearts, but by their full bellies. And that's exactly what was happening. The next thing that happens is that Jesus gives them what they need. It's given, but it's not received. Look what it says here in the text. Jesus goes on and says, Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Jesus is giving them what they need. He's trying to direct their attention not to bread, but to him. Not from the physical, but to the spiritual, and they are missing it. He's saying, don't labor for things that are going to perish. Don't let perishable things be your Messiah. That's what you're trusting in to bring you ultimate joy and satisfaction, and it's a fool's errand. I have a friend who bought a new truck a number of years ago, and we were able to ride in his new truck, and we're like, dude, this truck is sweet. And he said, yep, it is, but it's going to burn up someday. I it was like, I'd never heard anybody say something like that. It's going to burn someday. It, it's, it's not going to last. It's perishable. And you see, that's the right perspective. The crowd didn't have this perspective. They thought, I would be happy, or we would be happy. Our souls would be filled. We would be complete if we could just get free bread all the time. That would be the best. We would be living large if we could just get free bread 
all the time. Jesus says to them, don't labor for things that perish. And so what's Jesus saying here? Is Jesus telling us that we are supposed to quit our jobs and stop laboring for things that perish? Is that what Jesus is saying? And the answer is, yes. This week I want all of you to go quit your jobs, okay? That's what, no, that's not what Jesus is saying. There's got to be some kind of balance here. What he's saying is stop laboring for things that perish, listen now, in such a way where those things become ultimate to you. What does it mean that they become ultimate? It means that you're using them as your functional Messiah. It means laboring for things that perish, but you think in your mind, I'm laboring for things that will ultimately bring me that joy and satisfaction that I'm looking for, and Jesus says, it's not going to, it's going to perish, and your joy is going to perish with it. How many of you have ever gone on vacation before and forgot to clean your refrigerator out before you left? Anybody ever made that mistake? You come back and find some nice furry creatures in your fridge, right? We went on vacation in the middle of summer, and our deep freeze that's in the garage happened to break, and we had lots of frozen meat in that deep freeze. That was a bloody mess, and I'm not using that in the English sense of the, of the term. It was a mess, but the good thing is you can take that bloody rotten meat and just refreeze it, and then when you grill it, all that bacteria just gets cooked out. <laughs> Anybody want to come over for steaks later? Anybody? No, it was gross. It all went in the trash can. Friends, everything, everything material that we gain is going to perish. All of it. Well, that's a really nice house. Yep, it is a nice house. But, eh, it's going to burn up someday. Nice car. Yep. It's going to be great firewood someday. Everything is going to perish. So Jesus is not saying, don't stop working. What he's proposing here is that don't work for things in such a way that you make them ultimate. Friends, all of us, we're going to leave this place and go into our work week, and we are going to go to work, and we're going to labor for things that will perish. You are going to waste your time this week. Labor. I'm kidding. This. You're really not going to. Jesus wants us to work. But he wants us to work in such a way where we don't make those things ultimate. And so, how then do we labor for things that perish, but simultaneously labor for things that don't perish? Because that's what Jesus says here, verse 27, do not labor for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the God the Father has set his seal. How do we do both of those things at the same time? Laboring for food that perishes, but also laboring for food that does not perish. And the answer is in the last two verses, verses 28 and 29, and I'm going to say it like this as the heading for these two verses. We all need the spiritually satisfying Messiah. Some people are looking for a Messiah that will provide peace. Some people are looking for a Messiah that will provide material things. But we all need what we really need is a Messiah that will spiritually satisfy. And so they ask a question here about works in verse 28, and it says, Then they said to him, What must we do, Jesus, to be doing the works of God? You see, Jesus had said, Don't labor for food that perishes. Instead, labor for food that doesn't perish. And so he's using a parallel statement, but he's not actually saying you have to work for your salvation. And so they ask him, they get confused, they ask him, tell us the work that we have to do. What are the works we have to do to gain this bread that doesn't perish? That's what they're asking him for. And it's a very predictable question at this point. They want what he has to offer, but they're thinking of it in physical terms. And he says, no, that's not how it works. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said, it's not works. Notice the change in tenses here. Verse 28, doing the works of God. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said, this is the work of God. It's singular, not plural, not works, work. This is the work of God. There's only one work that has to be done to gain the bread that lasts for, eternal, for eternity, and it is that you believe in him whom he has sent. In short, Jesus says, it's all about faith. I'm not giving eternal life. I'm not giving eternal bread because you've worked for it. 
I'm not giving you eternal life because you've been good enough or done enough good things. I'm not giving you eternal life because you were baptized as a baby or took communion or any of those things. I'm giving you eternal life because you will trust in me. And if you trust in me, if you believe in me, but outrageously, this was the thing the crowd wouldn't do. They asked him, tell us what we have to do. He says, I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to believe in me. And they say, eh, sorry, we'd rather have to work for this eternal bread. Jesus says, no, that's not how it works. You don't work for it. You don't earn it. I give it to you. You believe and you receive. You see, some people are looking for a Messiah who's a peace provider. Some people are looking for a Messiah who's a provision supplier. Others of you here this morning, I don't know how Jesus functions for you, but last week we talked about some of the different ways that Jesus can function Maybe Jesus to you is your bodyguard. Maybe Jesus to you is your chef. Maybe Jesus to you is your fertility doctor. Maybe Jesus is to you, I don't know, what are you using Jesus for? The people in the story wanted a Jesus that would give them peace and freedom. They wanted a Jesus that would give them food and fill their bellies. And so how do we work for the food that endures to eternal life while at the same time working for food that perishes simultaneously. Now, there's a theme that runs through both of these stories, and so here's where I'm going to draw these two stories together. There's a distinct theme between both of these stories. The story of Jesus walking on the water. How does it end? They toil. They're working hard against the storm. Suddenly, Jesus enters the boat, and ah, toiling ceases. The labor ceases. The people say to Jesus, what can we do to work? How can we earn? How can we pay for eternal life? Jesus says, you don't pay for it. I give it to you with faith. And you have ah, rest. It's a gift. Labor cease. So in both these stories, you have this common theme of ending your toiling, ending your labor. And so I think the big idea as we come to the end of this section of Scripture is this. Jesus offers bread that provides ultimate rest for your soul. And this is one of the greater aspects. He showed us the lesser. I can provide bread for you, but that lesser was supposed to point to the greater. And this is one of the greater things he's trying to point to. And he's going to give us different aspects of this bread as we continue to go through chapter 6. But I think this aspect of this bread that Jesus gives us is so important. He offers us bread that provides ultimate rest for your souls. The disciples in the boat were toiling against the storm, and Jesus entered the boat, and they had rest. The people come to Jesus and say, what must we do? How can we work to earn this bread? And Jesus says, don't earn it. Don't work for it. Just rest. Just rest in me. Cease your labor How does that work? How can we rest? How can we both work for food that perishes, but also at the same time rest in Christ? I think a lot of it has to do with our end goal. What is at the end of our path? There's a TV show my wife and I were watching recently, and in the TV show, this husband and wife and family, they bring a foster child, a teenage foster child into their home, and then this foster child has to leave and go back to her family, and before she leaves, the dad comes to her and says, remember what I told you, don't drop out of school, keep working hard, keep your grades up. Why? Why did I tell you that? And the girl repeats the phrase that he taught her. The girl says this, I know, I know, big house, nice car. And he says, that's right, big house, nice car. That's why you work hard and keep your grades up. You see, what he just told her was absolutely horrendous advice. He led her down a path of dissatisfaction and not satisfaction. Because unfortunately, it doesn't matter how big your house is, someone always has a bigger house. And how big your car is, someone has a nicer car than you do. And if that is at the end of your path, if that is your goal, if that's the end objective, if that's ultimate, you will not find that rest. However, if Jesus is at the end of your path, you will find rest. And maybe your path is working, and you will go to work this week, and you will labor for things that perish, but those things are not ultimate. Jesus is ultimate. Jesus is the end goal. 
The fact that I will have eternal life someday is the end goal. That's what I'm working for. What if the end goal is eternal life? What if it's a heavenly home, a big house that's built by God? What if it's not a car, but heavenly transportation, some kind of incredible monorail system that Jesus builds in the kingdom? I don't know what it's gonna be like, but it's gonna be cool. And those are the visions that should fill our eyes and our minds as we trust in Jesus That's the end goal. And you see, the end goal determines how you take your journey to get to the end goal. If your end goal is big house, nice car, that's going to determine the way your journey looks. If your end goal is Jesus, suddenly all these other things fall into perspective. So what does it look like to work to that end goal? What does it look like to focus on Jesus? What does it look like as he says here in verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. What does it look like to eat that bread that lasts forever? I think it looks like inviting him to your, into your boat, being okay that the storm is still there. The storm stinks, yes. It's not fun, but he's in your boat, and so it's gonna be okay. You can have peace. It's okay if you don't have everything in this life. Note here in the text, they ask for another free lunch, and Jesus says no. He leaves their bellies empty this time around. But it's okay. I can experience starvation. I can experience want, but it's okay because my end goal is Jesus. Having stuff's not ultimate. Jesus is ultimate. Knowing someday that you won't be hungry ever. Knowing someday you'll never want for anything knowing someday that even though your marriage isn't what it be today, that it will be perfect someday. Knowing that those rebellious teenagers may not get all their issues ironed out, and they probably won't. But that's not the end goal of today. The end goal is Jesus, and Jesus will have the last word. See, my faith and my hope is an eternal life in Jesus. John Piper said it like this, you have before you the fragile, not the fragile hope of a few morsels of enjoyment, but the absolute certainty of the everlasting cabin by the lake with Jesus. And you won't be too old to enjoy it. You'll be young forever. And the everlasting ocean cruise with Jesus. And the everlasting evening by the fire with a good book and Jesus. And the fact that you don't need to have that now because you know you will have it forever changes everything. And so, how do you complete this statement? Things would be so much better if all of us have something we could put in that blank. Here's how all of us should ultimately complete this statement. We should all complete this statement like this. Things would be so much better if I have more of Christ every day. And I have more of Christ every day in anticipation of enjoying Him fully and forever and enjoying the eternal life that I have in Him. When that's ultimate, everything else falls in place. And that's what Jesus was telling His audience. Make that ultimate. Next week, we'll see more aspects, actually in two weeks, we'll see some more aspects of how this bread that Jesus offers truly satisfies our souls.